When we think about mass repression, when we think about things like genocide, we are often confronted with these massive, incomprehensible numbers. And one of the things that I hope to do with this project is to bring individuals back into the picture to get a micro-historical look at this history. I got interested in Russia and the Soviet Union um, by chance. I'm not Russian, I have no Russian background, um, but I was fascinated um, by the language. Took courses in Russian language and Soviet history, and I had a teacher there who was an exchange professor from the Komi State Pedagogical Institute in Siktivkar. Several years later, I had the great fortune of studying abroad in uh, Siktivkar, the capital of the Komi Republic. And I'd never been to Russia before, grew up in a small main town, and so this was one of my first experiences traveling abroad. And before I went, I had read the works of Alexander Solzhenitsyn and other writers who survived the Gulag, and I had a pretty good sense of what it was and how people had written about it, but I had never been to Russia before, let alone been in a, lived in a region where they used to exile people. And so that really um, affected me and, and made me interested to learn more about the region. I was really taken aback by how the past still reverberated so much um, in the present when I, when I studied there in 2009. My dissertation is called Remembering the Gulag, and it explores the ways in which the cultural memory of political repression, particularly the cultural memory of the Gulag, have been um, commemorated in, in texts, monuments, museum exhibits. I was really interested in the prisoners' perspective on what they had lived through and the ways in which the people who once bore the brunt of Stalinist repression and survived contributed to this process. This was very much a history that these people wanted to tell, but they did not ultimately get the chance to do so until Glasnost of the late 1980s and then eventually the collapse of the Soviet Union. When they sent hundreds of, of memoirs and autobiographies and letters, and even donated uh, in their entire personal uh, family archives to local history museums. So I, I was very fascinated by the, those types of sources that I was finding, so I pivoted from the state archives and, and started looking at these um, little collections that were dispersed throughout, th throughout the region. One of the most interesting things I found was a collection of Konstantin Petrovich Ivanov, a former prisoner who could not like his peers, bring himself to write a full-length memoir. It was simply too painful for him. He had no interest in doing so. But he did draw his memories. He was an artist and he drew his memories of the camps and attempted to create this entire art series called Hope Dies Last. There were 54 different pieces he created from 1987 until the end of his life in 1998. To me, they represent this um, alternative form of storytelling um, that really doesn't uh, get noticed by historians. However, I was very struck by these images and how they contributed to the story that others were trying to tell, albeit through um, autobiographical writing. I'd probably be a high school history teacher. Um, I think that teaching uh, people how to um, think about the past and the ways in which it's constructed and to have a more critical attitude towards the sources that they're looking at and what they read, particularly when uh, more and more uh, people are getting their news online or from Twitter or Facebook. Being able to discern what is real actual information and what is biased or a not factual piece of information, I think would be using the skills of a historian that I was um, trained with uh, and bringing them into the classroom.